While it's difficult to imagine the four Turtle Brothers as being separated at all, humor us, and we'll answer this question. Who do you think will be the last one standing? Will it be Leonardo, the most disciplined fighter of them all? Raphael, the embodiment of rage and frenzy with two sides? Donatello, the tech whiz and arguably the smartest turtle in the room? Or Michelangelo, the happy-go-lucky dude who yells out cowabunga every chance he gets? Let us know in the comments who you think it'll be. But here's the thing, the TMNT curators have already answered that question, and it's by far the darkest thing we could quite ever imagined. The last Ronin miniseries published by IDW in October 2020 sees the creators of the Turtleverse, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, tell an apocalyptic tale of death, revenge, and, well, the last Ronin of the Hamato clan. Over five action-packed issues. This series takes place in the future and despite not being a part of the official continuity, has already had a sequel announced at the 2022 San Diego Comic-Con. But who exactly is this masterless ninja? What is his goal? And why do we call it the darkest TMNT story of all time? We'll answer all that and more in this video. This is the last Ronin miniseries, Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Infiltration and Execution The Revenge of the Last Turtle Begins Issue number one opens with a mutant turtle overseeing New York City from the other side of its shoreline. We can't tell which one because of his bandana being black. It's been a decade since planet Earth was properly inhabitable. Global warming and pollution has made the environment so bad that the rivers surrounding NYC are less water bodies and more toxic sludge. The turtle's brothers warned him that going through the river would be like swimming through a septic tank. But he swims over anyway because when all is said and done, he's not a human. He's a mutant. He tells his brothers he will see them on the other side, and we get a shot of New York City in the future. Walls all around the borders, search beacons scanning every inch of the enclosed area, and a massive Foot Clan tower. Well, towering over everyone and everything in the Big Apple. Once the turtle makes it across the water, he notices that the security on the outside is shoddy at best, noting that the Foot are more concerned with keeping people inside and aren't exactly expecting attacks from the outside world, which he calls their greatest mistake as he lobs over the rusty barbed wire and tells himself it's time to finish things or die trying. But no sooner had he started his revenge quest than he ran into a hurdle, more like a crowd of them, because our lone turtle didn't expect to see people in the streets apparently, for which his brothers chide him. And it's around this time that it becomes clear that the brothers he's talking to aren't exactly there. The trauma of losing his family must have broken this lost warrior's spirit and mind, because he was hallucinating talking to the other three brothers, when they clearly weren't there. Regardless of his mental and emotional state though, the last Ronin is prepared to do whatever it takes, and knows that his goal still remains the same. As he points aside towards the foot tower, he steals one of the bikes standing out of Hill Tees and makes his way to his mark. As the owner of the vehicle vows to chase him down for stealing a ride, but our guy doesn't care. After all, there's something to be said about hiding in plain sight, and this old turtle had picked up a few new tricks. As we see panels depicting him blowing up the base of the foot tower with relative ease, but his landing has no grace, as his brothers point out, and he ends up agreeing with them when they say he needs luck to get this thing done, because he infiltrates the Foot Clan's territory in NYC by using a good old fashioned sewage duct. As he makes his way into the Delta Quadrant, his brothers question his tactic, but he recalls the first lessons their father and master taught them. Strike hard, move fast, know when to do what, and most importantly, never give up. The last Ronin shushes his brothers by telling him, you can take the turtle out of the sewer, but you can't take the sewer out of the turtle. As if to immediately shut him down, the manhole cover that he exits through starts blasting sirens all over the quadrant, which draws the attention of multiple cybernetically enhanced foot ninjas, or singes, as one of the hallucinations calls them. And our Avenger is forced to rely on his base instincts and relentless training to make it all the way to the actual tower. After bashing in the heads of more than a few singes with his metallic tonfos and crashing a hovering cop car into a billboard in an attempt to fly, the last Ronin decides to stick the leaping over rooftops. 
Sticking to what he does best, he exclaims that he's coming for Oroku Hiroto, as we cut to the very man he's hunting down. Oroku Hiroto, the bastard son of Karai, grandson of the Shredder, current master of the Foot Clan, and iron-fisted ruler of New York City, the last living member of the Oroku clan summons his captain and inquires whether his eyes are deceiving him or has there been an actual security breach. After the captain confirms that it is the latter, Hiroto decides that this intrusion should be turned into an example. He wants all units in pursuit to broadcast their efforts live to all citizens of NYC, and he also commissions them to use lethal force. He sums up the lesson he wants to teach to the city in three words, pursuit, capture, and execution. In like two pages, he has already established himself as being worse than Shredder, thanks to his overly militant approach to what he is being told is an intrusion from a member of the lower classes, and his general air of grandiose delusion. But as evil as himself might be, his underlings sure are rather single-minded because the last Ronin is able to leap over multiple singes and successfully infiltrate the upper level of the Foot Tower. After dispatching several soldiers and elites using his unparalleled discipline, the last Ronin nearly makes it all the way to Oroku Hiroto, but his overzealous pursuit catches up with him. After bulldozing through multiple foot operatives like a one-man army, he comes up against a flying mousers, designed by the evil scientist Baxter Stockman himself who also helped Hiroto create the Singes, and is in an alliance with him. Hiroto realizes that the Infiltrator isn't a lower class citizen, but is one of the mutant turtles that this clan has been fighting against for decades, and let loose everything he has on them. Though the Ronin is able to knock out the smaller Mausers with EMPs generated through his Tanfas, he falls victim to the sheer momentum generated by a gigantic Mauser that takes him through the window of the level they were at, and all the way down to the street. As he falls, he thinks to himself that it can't end like this. Every bone in his body was crushed by the fall, and he was coughing up blood, but all he could think of was his mission. He growled at the footmaster and called Hiroto a coward, but he knew he was on the edge here. So the last Ronin made his escape into the sewers, and the Sinja pursuing him were misled by the same young woman whose bike he had stolen at the beginning of the issue. Young Miss Jones followed the Ronin's trail and realized that he'd lost way too much blood and would die any moment. So she rushed after him into the sewers as well. The scene cuts back to Hiroto who's talking to Kurai. Well, her unconscious body currently kept in stasis, but you get what I mean. The last scion of the Orogu clan is musing that he'd finally gotten rid of the mutant menace once and for all, but he couldn't understand exactly how one of them survived the attack he made on them a decade ago. His mood is ruined by his captain who informs him that the terrorist is alive. The scene cuts back to the sewers where the last Ronin's giving himself a final speech. He knew this was a suicide mission from the start, but he kept at it anyway because he wanted to go out with honor. Fulfilling his duty to his clan, he lays out his weapons and bandanas that are all too familiar to us. A bow staff, a pair of nunchucks, a pair of sighs, and a broken katana. He takes out a book that belonged to his father, Master Splinter, and picks up the katana to go on his own terms. But just as the last Ronin is about to commit seppuku, he bleeds out and falls unconscious. That's where the Jones girl finds him and she's shocked. The last couple of pages show the last turtle wake up in a room that looks like it's their old sewer lair. His brothers are giving him a rough time as usual, but something's off. He realizes this isn't a dream. And when he snaps back into reality, he also realizes that he's in the old lair. Yes. And the person he was talking to was none other than April O'Neil, his dear old friend. The last Ronin looks confused at his condition, having clearly been saved by Jones, but the only one who's more confused is April, because she couldn't understand who Micah was talking to, revealing that the last Ronin was none other than Michelangelo. Betrayal, Ambush, Deaths, and Vengeance how Michelangelo became the last Ronin. Issue number two opens with April having a flashback to the night that marked the beginning of the end for the Turtles. She and Casey had decided to go tell the guys that they were going to get married and that they were on their way to April's home from the lair. The couple was extremely happy, but little did they know that these might be the last moments they shared with each other. Because just as Casey made a check-in on their progress, Raph burst into their house, bloody and battered, and started clearing a table. Donatello and Michelangelo were close behind with Master Splinter in between them. 
Their sensei had been wounded, bad, by an ambush from the Foot Clan who'd chosen to break the truce that Karai and Leonardo had established. Leo was acting as a rear guard while April tended to Splinter's wounds. She's a good enough medic, but Splinter's injuries were too severe. He was bleeding out and needed a doctor to help him, otherwise the turtles would be fatherless and masterless in one fell swoop. Leo agreed that they needed to move Master Splinter, but before any of them knew it, Raphael had sneaked out of April's home to go against the Foot and Karai by himself. The red bandana brandishing turtle had always been known for his fierce temper and fiercer fighting skills, but something told Leonardo that this particular night smelt of doom. That's when the flashback ends and we see that April has lost two limbs, presumably due to something that happened the same night. She calls out to Casey to help her put on her prosthetic limbs as the scene cuts back to Michelangelo, who's discussing how crazy it is that April's still alive with the ghost of his brothers. Mike says that the explosion knocked him out so hard that he temporarily lost his memories for days. Ghost Raph says it's yet another miracle that April is still alive, and Ghost Donnie adds that surviving that explosion should have been impossible. Ghost Raph quips that he must have missed that one when Ghost Leo sarcastically implies that he went and did something stupidly hot-headed and got himself killed instead. This starts an argument between the ever-arguing turtles, and Mikey loses it at the apparitions of his brothers. He screams that he knew it was a one-way ticket from the beginning, and that he did it for their family and their honor, but he stops short at that last word. Mike gathers himself and his resolve, saying he knows he should be dead, but because he isn't, he'll finish what their father started. He pours four cups of green tea, one for himself and three for his dead brothers. They lift their cups and Michelangelo vows that he will kill the last Odoku and avenge his family. Just as we go back into the past to see Raph's stupid mistake, turns out he ran after Karai and her entire contingent alone, ditching Casey, who wanted to join him, and his brothers, who kinda wanted to kill him as well for doing this. Raphael catches up to Karai, who intends to Settle the score once and for all, and engages all her soldiers by himself. How much time did it take for the soul turtle to cut through dozens of foot ninjas? We can't tell you, but what we can tell you is that by the time Raph came face to face with Karai, his shell was pocked with arrows. His body had several cuts on it, he had a slight limp, and, but every other foot soldier was dead, and the only one left standing was Karai. Raph and Karai engaged in a vicious battle, hurling insults at one another, and it looked like Raph had her beat when he took her and jumped into the East River, but Karai managed to whip out a kunai underwater and bury it in Raph's throat, shockingly killing the most fierce turtle of them all. We see his sigh sink into the river that was bloody by this point, as the scene cuts back to the present with April chastising Mikey for getting out of bed this early. She tells him he needs to rest to get back to full strength, but Mike shakes it off saying he needed some tea. Turns out even a decade old tea leaves can give you a brilliant cup. Mike doesn't mind it, and April only drinks coffee these days, so the beverage situation is sorted. She catches Mike staring at her prosthetic limbs and tells him that they're a souvenir from their last meeting, before observing that they had a lot of catching up to do. As April whips up some breakfast using real eggs from the black market, none of that synthetic seminella stuff for her, thank you, she notes that Mike's stunt had really rattled Hidoto's cage. Mike tells her that wasn't the plan, and she says she knows, but the results of his actions stand as they are. She notes that he only survived the fall because his mutation had progressed and made him far stronger than he used to be. And Mikey agrees, saying if he had been younger, he'd have died. But his newfound healing factor didn't do anything for his head, which was still fuzzy, thus making it even more confusing when April called Casey for breakfast. Because as far as he recalled, Casey Jones was dead. And that's when we got the reveal that Casey was actually April and Casey's daughter, Casey Marie Jones. Sorry, too many Casey's in a couple of sentences, but you get a point, right? Right? Anyway, April's daughter walks in and introduces herself as a huge fan of the Turtle Brothers. Evidently, her mom had regaled her with stories about the good old days, and she even recognized Mikey as the funny one. But as April said, they had a lot of catching up to do because there was nothing funny about Michelangelo anymore. In the meantime, Oroku Hiroto had replaced his former captain and given his new ones orders to crack down on New York City, inside and outside the walls to find the last Ronin. He reminds his new captain of the future that awaits failures, as we see the last captain's skull being feasted upon by carrion crows. The scene cuts back to the lair where Casey and Mike enter the old training room. Casey reveals that she had been practicing martial arts since she was a kid, and that she knew instantly what Mike was preparing for when she found him. Mike thanks her for keeping his family's belongings safe, and when she asks him where he was all this time, he explains how he became the way he is now. After his family's death, Michelangelo lost his spirit 
He made his way into the snowy peaks of a mountain, unaware of the effects it would have on his non-acclimated body, looking for an answer of some kind, but all he found was suffering. His mutant nature kept him from freezing to death, so he decided to isolate himself and hone his mind and soul. Michelangelo entered a state of deep meditation and reflection, going through his father's book multiple times and thinking solace would be his ultimate fate. But in the end, he was attacked by a few locals who wanted to toy with him before putting him down. And that is what pissed him off. There was no honor in what they were doing to him, so he cut them down and resolved to finish what his father had started. Mikey traveled to the world perfecting many techniques that his father had collected in his journal over the years. And when he was ready, he took a ship from Italy to New York City to finish his mission. The last page of his journal reminds him what he must think of when going up against the last Soroku. No peace. He takes his journal from Casey, telling her he's still got work to do, to which she replies that her crew will help him out. Mikey opposes this, telling her he doesn't want to be responsible for any deaths besides his own, but he can tell Casey is not one who will be dissuaded so easily, so he gives in, musing whether she takes after her father or her mother, as the issue closes with April O'Neil clutching the head of a fugitoid robot. Recollection and Retribution, the plan to eradicate Oroku Hiroto formulates. Issue number three opens with another flashback, but this time from the perspective of the bad guy. At 16 years old, Oroku Hiroto is sworn in as the leader of his clan. Following the critical injuries suffered by Karai and the death of his grandfather Shredder, he tells his generals that he was destined for this position. As he claims his birthright, he issues his first command as the clan head. He would invite the leaders of the Hamato clan to a parley stating that the war has gone on for too long and it was time to speak of peace. Back in the present, Hiroko talks to his unconscious mother and tells her that he is about to remind the citizens of New York City exactly who their master is and why. He then broadcasts a holographic message to the entirety of New York City, claiming that the two decades that New York had spent under him are the most prosperous in its history but that an intruder had tried to take that away from all of them by trying to have their beloved leader killed. He broadcasts Mikey's picture across Times Square and says there will be a citywide search warrant for him, and anyone who tries to harbor the turtle will suffer a fate worse than his. Hiroto then implements martial law in New York City, and his sinjas literally waterboard people off the streets. Casey's crew realizes the gravity of the situation and tries to contact her as soon as possible, as we cut back to the lair where Mike and his ghost bros are discussing young Mrs. Jones. The rest of the turtles remark that Casey is way in over her head and doesn't have any kind of training for what they're going to be going up against. But Mikey reminds them that they were exactly the same in their youth. He says that every action they've ever taken has culminated into this moment, which ends up getting interrupted by the very topic of the conversation. Casey apologizes for disturbing Mike, he was talking to himself after all, and tells him that her mom wants to see him in the lab. She also tells him she's going topside to survey the scene, and Mike tries to stop her but she just tells him she doesn't need his permission and guides him to the lab. That leaves the conversation gnashing his teeth and thinking about just how stubborn this young girl was, and way too young to be doing this old people stuff. But Mikey sucks it up and goes to see April where he gets another surprise in the form of Professor Honeycutt, or whatever's left of him anyway. The fugitoid head April whipped out at the end of the last issue belonged to the turtle's robotic friend, and the two survivors then give us a further recollection of the events that led them there. Turns out Splinter decided to actually accept the invite for a parley, hoping that the losses of both sides had suffered would be enough to make Oroku Hiroto see that peace was the only real solution. Mike, Leo, and Donnie are all skeptical, but their master is a true follower of the ninja way, and would not decline an invitation that was made observing the utmost respect. Professor Honeycutt helped Donnie put together a cloaking mechanism that would keep him and his father safe all the way to Japan if nothing went sideways, and Splinter told Leo to keep their strikers in a neutral position. If it appeared that his side was going to be aggressive in America, whilst engaging in peace talks in Japan, the whole thing could have fallen over. Leo agreed with his father and the two teams split up. Splinter and Donatello would travel to Japan, while Leo and Mikey would stay in New York and oversee things there with Casey, April, and Honeycutt, and the rest of their guys. But no sooner had Splinter and Donnie taken off than the nefarious Baxter Stockman made a final play to acquire the Fugitoid. He used his ground forces to track the turtles to April's store on Bleecker and Sullivan, and unleashed a hellish assault on Leonardo's forces. As he scrambled to formulate a response team, Casey charged Mike with protecting April and Honeycutt. Casey then joined the fray along with his boys, but it became painfully clear very soon that these foot ninjas were different from their usual ones. That's because this was technically the debut of their pesky singes. 
and it took all Leo's concentration to defeat multiple waves of them. Honeycutt realized that Stockman is somehow tracking him and threatens to self-destruct if the professor doesn't stop his assault. He was hoping that his greed would outweigh his bloodlust, but he was wrong because Stockman simply blew up all his machines in the vicinity, claiming if he couldn't have Honeycutt, then no one would. In the aftermath, only Mike, April, and Honeycutt survived. If you can call their current state survival, that is. Back on the surface, Casey meets up with their crew and realizes what has transpired. They immediately decide to rendezvous underground and split up into teams to increase their odds of survival. Casey tells her team to stick to the sewers, but breaks that rule herself, looking to cut down on time. In the process of doing so, she ends up attracting the attention of foot singes. But it turns out she's a one-woman wrecking machine, because she doesn't even break a sweat while dispatching them. But she realizes she's running out of time and needs to go back to her mother soon. Just as we return to the lair where April's taking blood samples from Mike to ostensibly track the progress of his mutation, he asks her if Honeycutt is still alive, and she says she doesn't know. But she thinks he is, as she deduced that Stockman managed to hack Honeycutt, which was how he found them that night. And then she recounts her own story of survival. Following the blast, remnants of Leo's strike team saved her and got her immediate medical attention. April had lost an arm, a leg, and was somehow still pregnant with a healthy fetus. It took her months of extensive physical and mental therapy to get back on her feet, emotionally and literally, but she managed to do it. When she left the hospital, she had a shiny new arm and leg and a baby, so she decided to go to the old lair because it was the only place she could think of being safe anymore. The same strike team members helped her recover Honeycutt's head, and having recalled her own story, she asks Mikey to tell her his. After the blast, turns out Mikey got blown entire city blocks away, which could explain the concussion all right. He tried to contact Donatello from the lair, but he was too disoriented to do anything else. So he grabbed all the weapons he could from the lair and stowed himself on a plane to Japan, intent on warning his father and brother personally. He tells April he didn't know what else he could do, and she tells him that his survivor's guilt is speaking, and he is truly blameless. She tells him there is a way that they can beat Hiroto. That's when Casey walks in demanding to hear it, filling them both in on the situation upstairs. April lays out her plan. Every piece of tech that the foot used these days was designed by Baker Stockman, who operated off a private island far away from the foot tower. Her idea was simple, infiltrate Baxter's fortress, find him, and disarm all of his tech using Professor Honeycutt's latent consciousness. Only one problem though, there was a one in a billion chance of this succeeding. Something Mikey points out as well, but April tells him this is the only shot they'll ever have. So he agrees to do it, and is shown a rather sick armored vehicle by April who says Donatello would have been proud of the design. Elsewhere, Oroko Hiroto stalks New York City rambling like a madman, talking about not getting abandoned anymore and how he was better than Shredder himself. The lunatic resolves himself to end the family's long-lasting war with the turtles himself, if that's what it takes. Which moves us to the next part of the Last Ronin saga. Assault on Baxter's Isle. The last Ronin attacks alongside his new protege. Issue number four opens with Mike and Casey pinned down in the heat of battle. Mike calls into April, but his radio is worthless. He bemoans the fact that he told them that this was a bad idea, but Casey gets him back on the job at hand. She tells him that her team can handle the gun tower while April's working on getting back online. But Mike vetoes the idea. He asks her team to lay down suppression fire while he creates an opening and wades into the front lines by himself. Mike leaps over his cover and orders Casey to drop tons of smoke bombs, to which she replies, yes sensei, indicating she had officially become his disciple. Mike starts cutting through Mausers like butter and thinks to himself that this is too easy when he sees Baxter Stockman in his fortress. The evil genius is so ignorant of his position that he puts down this full-scale assault on his facility to junk drivers looking for loot, and pays no mind to it. He just turns his bots up to lethal force and gets right back to his research. In the meantime, Mikey's having a bit of a struggle taking on so many Mausers at once, so Casey lends him a foot by kicking one's metallic head clean off its shoulders. Mike chides his student for terrible discipline, but backs it up by saying her initiative was excellent. Casey takes pride in the fact that she's finally learning what it is to be a real ninja, as we cut back to a few days before the attack. Michelangelo was observing Casey at her daily training, and noted that her technique was decent, but she picked up some bad habits. Ghost Leo wants to see what she could do with 10 years of real training, but Ghost Raff reminds them that they don't have 10 years. Mikey said he's going to train her regardless, because if she was going to fight, 
She better learn how to do it well. He sneaks up on her and tells her that she had basically wasted all her time working on moves she couldn't even execute properly. He says that all she did was basic cardio, which gets Casey worked up. Mike pushes her by asking her to hit him as hard as she can, and calling her a child when she refuses to do so. After getting Casey sufficiently mad, he proceeds to outclass her at every step, avoiding all her attacks while pointing out their flaws. In the end, he hasn't even broken a sweat, while Casey is running on fumes. He tells her to reflect on how she could have done that all differently. The brash child starts taking out her frustration on the wall, so she twists her arm a bit, and we do mean that literally. Mike ends up telling Casey that he's willing to train her to fight for real, and this sends her over the moon because Casey grew up idolizing the turtles and having one of them become her sensei was a legit dream come true. He informs her that training begins the next day and asks her to cut her hair while April tells him Splinter would have been proud of what he's doing here. Mike is worried that he might have overstepped a boundary, but April tells him that they were all Splinter's children, and that she was actually glad he was doing this for Casey. Then she asks him to finish his story, so he gets right back to explaining how he got to America again. After landing in Japan, he made his way to the ancestral home of the Hamato clan, where he met Master Shinichiro. Mikey had been asking his fellow clansmen about his father and brother, but so far all he had gotten was the same sullen look from every single one of them. When he came face to face with Shinichiro, he begged him for news on his family members' lives. Mikey was desperate and after a long silence, Shinichiro told him that there are people, preachers, teachers, warriors, heroes, and legends, and that his father, Master Splinter, was all of them. Turns out, Odoko Hiroto had betrayed his father and brother at the official parley. After calling his guests to a graveyard for a meeting, Hiroto ambushed them with foot ninjas aplenty. Master Splinter immediately got to work, cutting through the undisciplined foot ninjas like a hot knife through butter. Donatello and the rest of the Hamato envoys followed his lead, but their superior skill wasn't enough to make up for Oroku's numbers advantage. Hamato clan members were starting to give ground, so Hiroto ordered his archers to get ready for the final attack. Splinter taunted the last Odoku into attacking him head-on, putting his pride as a warrior before practical sench, and tragically, that's what got him and his son killed. As Splinter hurled his katana into Odoku Hiroto's chest, the Foot Clan loosed countless arrows onto him and Donatello. The Hamato Clan reinforcements forced the Foots to retreat by raining arrows on them, but it was too late. They couldn't save Splinter and Donatello, and Shinichiro ended up becoming the bearer of bad news for Michelangelo. Mike's heart sank then. He found the answers he came looking for, but they were steeped in tragedy. The Hamato clan offered him in as one of their own and gave him a place he can call home. But that didn't feel right to him, so he went into the mountains and began his isolation and meditation. After getting attacked by ignorant villagers, he decided he had to end the feud himself. And that's how he got to training, and got back into the States. He tells April even if he knew she were alive back then, his mission would have remained the same. And she tells him she understands. She's actually very happy about what ended up happening because Casey has taken to Mike like he had took to Splinter. But that's when something unexpected happens. Mike accuses April of setting him up to become Casey's sensei, and it is revealed that Casey is a mutant herself. Turns out, after spending countless years in close proximity with the turtles, had affected April and Casey Jones Sr. to the point that their child was born a mutant. Young Mrs. Jones wasn't growing a shell anytime soon, but she did have superhuman strength and endurance, which was enough for April to take Mike's blood samples and track the progression of her mutation. Mike is understandably upset, but he agrees to keep this a secret for his oldest surviving friend, and then he prepares to meet April's other friends. These friends turn out to be the very strike team that was seen in the opening of this issue. Mike and April learn that Hiroto and Baxter have a very strained relationship, and surmise that this is possibly their best chance to immobilize the foot without their knowledge. Given that Baxter and Hiroto hated each other, they probably wouldn't interfere in each other's affairs until the last possible moment. And that gave them enough leverage to take out the nerve center of the Foot Clan's mostly robotic army. Mike and his team are able to infiltrate Dr. Baxter's island fortress successfully. Though to call it easy would be an insult to Stockman's genius. The man is a leading robotics expert after all. He keeps Mike and company pinned down with heavy fire and electrical action. But that's when April O'Neil shows up to the party. She takes out every Mauser in the area with her armored tanker, and slams it right into Stockman's command center, where she finds a powerful enough energy source to plug Hennigut's head into. Baxter Stockman catches up with her and eats a backhand from April for breakfast, but ends up losing his ultimate battle of technology supremacy with the Fugitoid. Because at that moment, Honeycutt activates and disintegrates Baxter Stockman's entire body, destroying himself in the process as well. 
After Stockman had been dealt with, the nanobite swarm that used to be Honeycut enters all of Stockman's systems, infecting them with a virus that effectively shuts down all the foot tech and defense systems across New York City. Hiroto immediately puts his private army on high alert as the city falls into lawlessness around him. On Baxter's Isle, Casey exclaims they've won, but her mother reminds her that the victory was simply in a battle. The war remains, and Michelangelo is not willing to pay the price he had to pay to get Baxter anymore. This will be the final showdown between Oroku and Hamato clans, and he intends to protect everyone else with his death. The Final Battle Oroko Hiroto vs. Hamato Michelangelo and the Birth of a New Era Issue number 5 opens with Michelangelo in deep thought. Ghost Donatello muses that he's only ever been in Splinter's room once, and that was when he was still alive. Ghost Raph asks him to cut the crap because he's concerned that Mike has been sitting around for too long. And surprisingly enough, Ghost Leo backs him up. He says that Mikey had the perfect opportunity to strike. He had Hiroto on the ropes with the attack on Baxter, and if he hadn't pursued, they'd have likely won. Donnie backs Mikey by saying he understands the pressure he's under, what with him being the last turtle and all, and Raph just mocks him for being such a weakling. Mike snaps at his dead brother's hallucination, saying he wished he could bring him back to life so he could kill him again, but he also realizes that he has a duty to fulfill. When he came to New York, he thought he was alone, but now he had people he needed to protect, and a student he wanted to pass his Bushido onto. The assault on Baxter's Isle caused too many casualties, and Mike isn't prepared to let that happen and again to the people he cares about. So he asks Raph to can it and suits up one last time. Leo pipes up asking about his attack plan and Raph suggests a frontal assault as expected. But Mike finally asks them all to shut up. He says that their deaths weighed too heavily on him to be doing this with them right now. Mike finally voices his feelings and lets his brothers know that the cycle of vengeance was too much for the others to bear. They protest and call his accusations hurtful and Mike knows that, but he's done all he could for them. He asks his brother's hallucinations to leave and never come back, and finally, they do. After getting rid of his guilt and the voices in his own head, Mike scribbles something in Master Splinter's journal and leaves it at the lair before heading out one last time. Meanwhile, Casey and her resistance members are baffled by the way the citizens are looting and destroying the city. She calls mob mentality a virus as she receives an update from one of her peers. Apparently, they've been trying to establish a connection with the other resistance leaders in order to create safe zones from where they can launch attacks at the foot tower, but the landlines weren't exactly up to their speed, and there was something worse happening in the sewers. They were about to get flooded. The explosion at Baxter's Isle broke the water systems of New York City, and the sewers were getting flooded as they spoke. Casey rushed back to the lair to find her mother and her sensei, and to her shock, she only found the former. As for the latter, all she could find was Splinter's journal, and she immediately understood what happened. Michelangelo had gone off to battle Hiroto by himself without even informing any of them. She punches the bricks off the wall in frustration, but her mother restrains her and reminds her that this fight of his began long before she met Mikey and the guys. She also admitted that she wasn't sure when to tell her daughter that she was a mutant like the rest of the guys, but it was too late to explain in detail now. Casey was too young to understand what vengeance meant, but she was old enough to know that Mikey was family, and when it comes to fighting your family, you stay with them all the way to the end. She firmed up her resolve and headed after her sensei, who was approaching Foot Tower with breakneck speed. In the meantime, Oroku Hiroto was losing his mind over the fact that his worthless subordinates couldn't even contact Stockman. He commands that half of all of his soldiers be deployed to guard his level, and the other half be deployed into the streets as riot police. He also commands his captain to bring him his armor, because it was time he went on a mutant hunt. As if to stand him up at every possible level, Mike detonates thermite bombs on the same places he'd enter Foot Tower from in the first issue to launch a direct attack on the last Oroku. But the bomb turned out to be too powerful and alerted every Foot Clan member in the building of his presence. Michelangelo prepared to fight actual ninjas for a change, and thought to himself that Hiroto only had two options now, fight or flight and he was itching for him to choose the latter. After relying on singes for two decades, the regular foot soldiers had lost their discipline. Mike left a Kill Bill scene in his wake, musing that they also didn't want to fight for their current master. 
After dispatching a giant guard and a giant robot guard, in that order, Michelangelo finally comes face to face with the man he's been chasing for for five issues. Edoku Hiroto stands above him donning his own armor and berates Mikey for what he is. In response, Mike threatens to kill his mother, thinking that would inflict psychological damage. But Hiroto is a true psycho and kills his mom himself, claiming she abandoned him in his childhood and that he only kept her alive as a pet. Hiroko Hiroto then slips on the visor of his nanobot armor and the last shredder attacks the last ronin in earnest. Their fight takes them all over the foot tower and also around it. Massive explosions alert the rest of the city to the situation that is unfolding, but Casey can't help but worry for his sensei. Mike notices that Hiroto isn't as mindful of fighter as he should be, but he also says that his armor practically makes him invulnerable. Every time Mike looks for a weak spot, Hiroto just covers it up with the nanotech, so he tries to taunt him into leaving an opening to create a weak spot on his own. The scene shifts to the sewers where Casey is worried sick about her mother. The rising water levels mean she's going to have to swim to save her, so she gets all her resistant members to evacuate and wait for her signal. She apologizes to Mike for going against his order, but also says that he has what he wanted, a one-on-one -on -one fight to the death with Hiroto. Casey locates her mother, gets a breath of air, punches off falling rocks to protect her, and then heads off to look for his sensei once they both make it to safe ground. April manages to fix the pumps and also injects a tracker on Mike, so she could locate him just in case. Before her daughter leaves, she urges her to be careful. Mike is finally finding his footing with Hiroto. He's hurt, slowing down, and his reflexes are not what they were at the beginning of the fight, but his experience kicks in. He blinds Hiroto with a flashbang and then stabs Raf's sigh into his palm, finally creating his own weak spot. The last shredder pulls out the sigh and breaks it in half, confident of his own victory. But just then, his tower explodes and his focus completely shifts to his former seat of power. Mikey uses the first rule of martial arts to his advantage and socks Hiroto off the building, right at the crossing of Bleecker and Sullivan, the site of his brother's deaths. Mikey stabs him with Leo's katana as he descends on Hiroto and then kicks it through him for good measure. Oroku makes to give up and forfeit, but Mike's rage takes over. He lifts a manhole cover intent to finish the job. But Hiroto managed to use that moment to slice through his abdomen. Mike regroups by smashing Oroku in the head with Donatello's staff and leaps into the sewers. The last shredder follows him, covering up his own wound with his armor and calling him out for being a coward. Michelangelo finally pulls out the nunchucks he hasn't lifted his entire miniseries and lays the smack down on Hiroto's candy butt. The two are pumped into the rivers and Mikey prepares for his last stand. Given his current physical condition, this was a do or die but he preferred to do then die. Mike punched the last Hiroku silly until he quite rightfully lost his own mind and tried to blow them both up by causing his suit to short circuit. Sadly for him, Mike was a mutant, and that kind of electricity was nothing to him. Oroku Hiroto, on the other hand, was a human being standing in a body of water that he had just electrocuted himself in. His corpse bubbled up to the surface after taking a plunge, rolled over, and then stopped moving. Michelangelo pulled himself onto the shoreline just as Casey showed up. She was racked with grief at seeing her master die, and told him that she was was just as much his family as his brother's. Mikey makes her understand that this is why he had to do this alone. He left Splinter's journal to guide her on her path to becoming a great ninja, but had amended a particular phrase on the last page to give her the most important lesson of them all, where his father had taught his sons to find no peace in their endeavors. Michelangelo urged Casey to no peace, all the beauty that it filled life with. Mike passed away with his oldest friend and his protege looking on and bidding him a last farewell, he woke up in a yellow tinted room, the same room that he woke up in in issue 2, and found his brother surrounding him. They were about to go topside for some fresh air, and the loser would be stuck with dishes for a week. Mike is slow to catch on as always and ends up coming last, so his brothers tease him, and Casey shows up, throwing Raph's claims that Mike had cut the cheese in his face by reminding them that whoever smelt it, dealt it and Master Splinter shows up saying he can't speak to Raph's flatulence, but he can safely say that New York City smells like home. Mikey reunites with his loved ones in the afterlife as the miniseries comes to an official end. In the epilogue, we see Casey training in the lair and musing how she wished her sensei could have seen her progress. She talks to her mom about the progress she's made on an experiment and asks what they're going to eat when her mother says she'll probably be working late. But Casey said she isn't talking to her, she's talking to them. As the final panel shows us four turtles in a glass dome, with Casey asking them to grow up quick because she has so much to teach them.
Marvelous Verdict. The Last Ronin is one of the best TMNT stories we've ever read, period. It's not just the fact that it's Michelangelo that ends up becoming the Avenger, it's also the fact that, to us, it makes sense. Mikey has always been the one guy in the group who never took himself seriously. Donnie, Leo, and Raph have always had one thing or another to focus on, but Mike was a lighthearted dude through and through, so it would be understandable for him to lose all that sense of humor and turn into a stoic assassin-type ronin after losing it all. The Last Ronin is an excellent study in character progression and apocalyptic storytelling without putting too many bells and whistles on the whole thing. It's five issues packed with meaningful dialogue, imagery, and plot lines that are simple enough to put off and such a short time frame, but with the intended emotional impact. You should go out of your way to read it, if only to show your friends one entire run of TMNT media where Mikey doesn't say cowabunga. Trust us, it'll be worth it. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks everyone!